Good afternoon. My name is Ian Foxley. I'm the CEO of Pyhesia. By way of background, and I'm sure you've read my bio, um, I was traditionally an army officer. I spent 24 years in the army, uh, all in the Royal Signals, and I had a wide variety of jobs going from armoured through Arctic warfare to a parachute squadron, um, some time in counter-terrorism, and I ended up commanding a regiment in Bosnia um, on peacekeeping operations. Um, and then actually I went into the MOD and it wasn't as exciting, so I left and joined commercial telecommunications. In 2010, I ended up in Riyadh in a company called GPT, which is a wholly owned UK subsidiary of Airbus Group. Now Airbus, you'll probably know, um, has uh, fame for building aircraft, but it also has a division that deals in defence communications through its satellite branch, and that led it on to other forms of defence communications. And I went to Riyadh to become the programme director in a brand new uh, contract for 10 years to modernise the communications of the National Guard of Saudi Arabia. And this was a £2 billion contract covering a wide range of defence communications. And I'd just like to show you here the other part, bit part players in the dramatis personae of the story I'm about to relate to you. Of course, there's Airbus Group. There's also GPT, which stands for General Electric Plessy Telecommunications. Some quite well-known communications companies there in the defence sector. The Saudi Arabian National Guard, and of course, the UK Ministry of Defence. Because this contract is a government-to-government -government contract. Our customer was not the Saudi Arabian general in the communications arm of the National Guard, but actually the Ministry of Defence uh, in UK. And through them, they then liaised and coordinated with the National Guard. I'm going to take you through the project and show you what went wrong and how I found out about it, what I did about it, and then what happened, and then we'll go on to look at the impact of that. But firstly, I'm going to give you an example. What you see in front of you is a module of uh, what's called a staff working environment. Now, this plugs into a number of other different modules, all of which would be uh, dropped off the back of box bodies, um, anywhere in the desert, plugged together, and effectively, it provides a, an all-singing, all-dancing, air-conditioned, fully electronically capable um, divisional headquarters into which the king could walk or the prince, Prince Miteb, who was the commander of the National Guard, could command an operation. And of course, we'd have a number of these because, as with all divisional headquarters, you would have a main headquarters, a step-up headquarters, a logistic headquarters, and that would be mirrored in another division or another region, and sometimes down at the brigade level as well. And just to give you a, a view of that, a division would be about 10,000, 12,000 men, and a brigade would be about three to 4,000 men, and the National Guard itself numbers 100,000 men. It's bigger than the British Army. I'll show you here a document, which is a live document, from the process of procurement for defence equipment for the National Guard. What you're looking at here is actually a document that gives the recommendation from the prime contractor for whom I worked to the British military team who would then OK it or not and pass the recommendation on to the commander of the National Guard who would agree it and we would then be told to purchase the relevant equipment, find the subcontractor, procure the equipment, deliver it, and then pass the invoice back to the British military team, who would then pay it on behalf of the National Guard. Now, what you're looking at here is, firstly, the signatures of all the relevant directors who had to sign off on the contract. And then at the bottom, and I've blown it up on, on the side here, a list of the equipment and services that you would buy with the relevant funding, a line called bought-in services, which I'll come back to, 
a subtotal, the prime contractor's charges, that would be our company charges for procuring the equipment, and then a total price payable. And this type of recommendation came with every single project that we had. Now, when you have small projects, this line of bought-in services doesn't feature very greatly because it's only about 16% across the board. And for a, let's say, a £100,000 contract, that would be about £16,000. And in terms of the, the magnitude of the whole program, that's not a lot. It's only when this first major contract came through for Signature that I raised my eyebrows and started saying, hang on, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look right because it's way out of scale with everything else and all the reasons that you, the managing director and the commercial director, have given me previously as to what bought-in services are. Now, I had looked at bought-in services and I'd raised inquiries as to what it was and was told that, oh, those are the things that we buy in. They're the things we don't have that we subcontract out, and like, like cleaning services or car maintenance or marketing. And when it's a small amount, it's reasonable. But when it's one and a half million pounds, you have to stop and say, what am I buying for one and a half million pounds? And the other point that I had was that when I was taught project management formally in the staff college in the UK Army, there are three, th three things that matter. Time, money, and specification. And when you address money, you as the project manager and the program director particularly, should treat that money as if it's your own. And you should answer questions of, what am I getting? Where's it coming from? And is it fit for purpose? And when I ask those questions, I could see what we're buying. I could also see, normally, that it was fit for purpose and where we're getting it from. But in this case, with bought-in services, nobody answered the question or would answer the question of what we were getting and who we're getting them from. Now, I put that up against all the other alarm bells and red flags that had been building over the past three-month period. And this would range, I don't intend to go through the whole lot, but I, I'll, I'll run you through some of them. Initially, I raised my eyebrows because I found out that I was the third programme director of this multi-million pound programme in six months. Now, that's unusual, because when you've got a programme that's this large, you would expect that a programme director had been selected who was competent and known and had experience of doing such things. I found the first programme director actually had um, known the finance director in Paris and he'd run an automotive company, but he'd been prepared to come on a, a fairly good pay package in a tax-free environment to run this programme. But to give him fair due, he put up his hands and said, no, um, this is beyond me. I'd never worked in the defence world. I don't know about some of this communications equipment. And the company had found him another job as a special projects manager. And they'd gone out and employed another programme director who had a PhD in programme management. And uh, he came in and lasted about two months before he too left. And the company had told me that he'd left not because he was incompetent, but because he wasn't a people person. He couldn't manage the team. And that sounds reasonable. Academics can sometimes be like that. But in his case, as I later found out, that wasn't quite the truth. So they found me through an advertisement in the Sunday Times and a series of interviews, and I came in to do the role. The next thing I found was that there was no project plan. There's no program planning. And program planning consists of taking all the composite projects and melding them together in a series of priorities and funding profiles to provide an overall strategic plan. And even though the contract had been running for six months, there was no programme plan. They had a number of projects in hand, and I'll come on to those in a moment. The third thing I found was that when I went to the finance director and said, uh, where's my budget? He said, oh, you haven't got a budget. And I said, what do you mean I haven't got a budget? He said, well, we 
haven't allocated one. We want you to run on a cost basis and we'll, we'll provide a budget for years going forward at the end of the year. And I said, well, that doesn't sound right because this is a two billion pound program. Under defence procurement rules, any program over 150 million has to be competitively run. And he said, no, no, not in this case. This was allocated to us by the MOD on a single source basis. But you just go and get on with it. And then managing director reinforced that by saying, like, your job is to concentrate on getting the program up and running and delivery of targets. Leave the rest to the commercial director and the finance director and me. The last one I'll point to is the, the illogical order of programs. Having found that I then had to put together the program plan, I went away um, for two weeks actually on a pre-planned family holiday that was allowed um, by the company. And it coincided with the beginning of Ramadan anyway, when the country actually fairly gradually um, eases back on commercial practice as, as the, the drivers of, of Ramadan impact on people. And I sat and I came up with a set of priorities and order for the plan. And I came back and I said, right, this is, this is how we should be doing it. And I explained my plan and it created a big ruckus amongst the directors. And I couldn't quite understand this because there was an illogical purpose to the current projects they were running. And to give you an example, um, there's one for electronic warfare, satellite communications and the staff working environment. They're the three major projects that we were getting on with. In terms of electronic warfare, we had a complete project team running a competition to buy a complete suite of electronic war warfare equipment because the National Guard did not have any capability in that regard at all. And I said, well, why are we doing this? If you buy top secret equipment and you want to operate it and load it with all the codes and capabilities that you'd need to run it operationally, where are you going to put it? And there was bewilderment around the, 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 the table. And I said, well, I have experience of having done this before in the British Army. And you have secure garaging where you can lock up top secret equipment. And you haven't planned any garaging, you haven't done any planning, you haven't got any allocation of space in the barracks in which to build it for the National Guard. So we need a civic engineering team to be able to do this. And then secondly, um, once you've bought the equipment, who's going to, who's going to operate it? Um, it's not the kind of thing that you can give to an ordinary soldier or even an ordinary signaller. This is specialist equipment. This is to do with surveillance, direction finding, location, jamming if, if you want to, and intelligence analysis. You actually have to train people in those capabilities. Moreover, you actually have to train the trainers. So you have to recruit the right kind of person to be a trainer, train him in it, and then recruit the soldiers to operate it and train them in it at the same time as you're building all the, the civil infrastructure as well. So we don't want to be buying this equipment for at least a year, possibly 18 months, possibly two years. And that created a big ruckus because they already had the, the team. They'd already made promises back to, to Airbus that, um, who were one of the contenders and in fact were one of the leading contenders to provide this equipment. Um, and it would mean stopping that major project. So, you can understand there were some, some emotions within the, the boardroom. I come down to this thing about bought-in services. Because when you have a series of alarm bells, you have two types. You have suspicion. And at the beginning of all of this, you have alarm bells which are escalating in your mind. And you're beginning to wonder why things are all getting a bit frosty and all a bit difficult. And then you find out that they're not suspicions, they're knowledge. And then later on, you find out that this is not true knowledge, this is partial knowledge. And I'll come back to that and how we found the covert payments in the Cayman Islands. But what I want to touch on now is that you're facing a personal ethical dilemma. Number one, you have these suspicions. 
do you just ignore them? Do you sign off the, the, the paperwork anyway and, and get on with it? Do you do a deal? Do you compromise and keep quiet? Or do you ask for a different job somewhere else in the group and walk away? Or you, do you just resign and go and go and find another job? Those are all the different options. And overlaying that is who's in on it and who can I trust? Because as soon as you make a move to do things, you're going to become the one person that nobody else wants to be friends with. And in the environment of Saudi Arabia, how do I get out alive? Let me tell you what happened. I went to see the commander of the British military team. And I said to him that, you know, I have some concerns. And he said, well, OK, I hear you, but you're going to have to uh, get me evidence. So I went and got the evidence and I brought it to him and I emailed it. I went into the email system and I found the evidence because I found a man who I'd been warned off who told me where it was. I sent it to the brigadier. He sent it to the MOD and the MOD gave it back to the company and said, let them deal with it. And in the interim, I waited almost six hours for a phone call back from the brigadier to say, OK, I've got the evidence, come and talk to me. And it didn't happen. But what did happen was that I got a phone call from my managing director who said, Ian, can you pop up to my office for a chat? And I did. And when I got there, I opened the door and there was the head of HR and the MD sitting waiting for me. The head of HR in GPT is Her Royal Highness Princess Noor Assad. She's the niece of the king. She's the first cousin of Prince Miteb, the commander of the National Guard. And ostensibly, her job is to uh, look after the, the visas, the passes, the permits, and allow us access or gain us access to the royal palaces because we looked after their communications as well. In reality, I think she had another role. And what I put up here is a chronology of the Airbus investigation. Because what I tripped over actually snowballed into a much bigger investigation. I blew the whistle in December 2010. It took me until March 2012 to persuade the Serious Fraud Office to actually uh, begin a formal investigation. PwC had been employed by GPT and Airbus to actually do an internal audit along with a company called uh, Ethics Intelligence, who gave Airbus a complete clean bill of health. And when it came out, I pointed out to the director of the Serious Fraud Office that the C in PwC um, actually belonged to a company called Cooper's Librand, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Cooper's Librand was the C who were taken in under a merger. And Cooper's Librand had been the auditors of GPT before KPMG. And therefore, if there was any history of corruption, were they likely to, to reveal it? And the answer that David Green, who's the director of the SFO, came up with was no. And he launched a formal investigation. The formal investigation then took the best part of 10 years. In the meantime, France launched the Parquet National Financier, uh, PNF, and established a mutual uh, agreement with the Serious Fraud Office, and the Department of Justice in America. And that resulted um, in 2016 with Airbus self-declaring corruption within the company across a whole range of different contracts. I'll come back to what the highlighted bit in a moment. And in January 2020, they agreed a deferred prosecution agreement with the three enforcement agencies, and in 2021, GPT itself pleaded guilty to corruption and were fined 30 million. To bring you right up to date at the moment, the trial of the managing director and another individual in the Cayman Islands who was the finance director for the intermediary company receiving payments um, started in April to June 2022 and was stopped and a retrial ordered, which is about to begin later this month. 
So I'm not going to take you much further down that path. Suffice to say, though, um, if we go back to the highlighted bit, in 2014, Airbus International Audit declared significant breaches of compliance to the Airbus board. And in 2015, UK Export Finance stopped, raised concerns about contracts underwritten by uh, the UK government, actually stopped those payments. So there was a bit of a crunch point for Airbus Group. What happened, and I only found this out about a year ago, um, when a film was released on ARTE, on French television, called La Bataille d'Airbus, The Battle of Airbus. And you can find it on this link. What happened was that in 2014, I went to America and was interviewed by the FBI. And Tom Enders, the CEO of Airbus, found out about it. And it severely worried him. And the film La Bataille d'Airbus actually catalogues the global battle, commercial battle, between Airbus and Boeing. And he wanted to declare to the SFO, because if he declared to the DOJ, that brought him into immediate confrontation with Boeing in that commercial battle and the potential for a massive fine, a drop in the share price and the vulnerability of his group. Watch the film. It's actually, it actually um, unfolds the whole story. So in 2014, he actually declared um, to the SFO, giving the SFO primacy of the prosecution. They brought in PNF and DOJ, and this concluded in a deferred prosecution agreement uh, in 2019. Over 10 contracts, worth a total of 22 billion euros, and they paid a fine of 3.6 billion. Um, they removed the whole of the board from the chairman down. And they also uncovered a special group within um, the sales and marketing organization um, of 100 people whose sole um, responsibility was to run the crooked contracts. What's interesting there, um, I'll just take you through um, some of the remarks made by the judge in the case. The conduct took place over many years. It is no exaggeration to describe the investigation it gave rise to as worldwide, extending into every continent in which Airbus operates. The number of countries is subject to intense criminal investigation by various agencies, and the scale and scope of the wrongdoing disclosed demonstrate that bribery was, to the extent indicated, endemic in two core business areas within Airbus. If we look at the, the, the organisational chart, you'll see Tom Enders overseeing this body here in strategy and marketing, which is where the 100 people uh, existed, and also the connection into compliance run by Pedro Montoya, the group compliance director, to whom I also declared the corruption, and their own counsel, their own legal affairs advisor, who advised not on the rectitude of it, but how to get round the different laws and regulations governing those contracts. Corruption was endemic throughout Airbus Group. A year later, GPT pleaded guilty and were fined 30 million, made up of 28 million pound fine and 2.2 million costs for the SFO prosecution. The last bit of it, therefore, is the prosecution of the individuals. And I won't touch on that um, because that's still sub judice. Where, where I do want to go is into the idea of the professional and personal implications of being a whistleblower. And I'll start with the professional one. I'm going to give you an analogy. In climbing, in mountaineering, when you climb a rock face, you have four points of contact, two hands, two feet. And the law, the basic law in climbing, and I'm not describing free climbing here, which is for madmen um, and mad women. But if you take off one hand and you retain two feet and an arm or another hand, you're stable. The more points of contact you take off the rock face, the less stable you become. Until if you take off four, you're in free fall. In life, you have four points of contact as well. 
home, health, work and wealth. You can take off any one of those and if the other three remain, then you are still stable. You can get yourself back on the rock face and keep climbing. You have a safety line. That safety line is made up of your, your close-knit friends and family who understand what you did and why you did it. You also have your, your inner beliefs and your values or perhaps your faith in, in the law, the church, God, which help to keep you on that rock face. And all these other responsibilities, you know, mortgage, everyday running costs, children, wife, all tend to be responsibilities that drag you off the rock face. This is what happens to you when you become a whistleblower. The first thing you lose is your work, your job, and with it, all these other things. These are the, the, the soft detriments that come to you. The second thing you lose is your wealth. You lose your income. You probably start losing your, your savings as well and you go into debt because you've got legal costs, you, you can't get another job, you're formally or informally blackboard within your sector. And that leads to anxiety, depression, all the stresses and strains of both loss of job, loss of esteem, loss of financial stability gather to put pressure on you and that inevitably impacts on your home life. And when I did my master's um, here in the University of York, I looked at stigmatisation of whistleblowers and what happens to them and how they survive it. And we found that this is a fairly standard process, no matter whether you're blowing the whistle on corruption or child abuse or, or, or mismanagement in the NHS. The system comes for you and this is what happens. This is what whistleblowers want. It's the direct corollary of what we've just looked at. They want to return to the status quo. They want their job back. Ideally, they want an enhanced professional reputation for being an honest broker. They want no loss of income. They want no loss of, of, of family savings. Ideally, they want restitution, but they want compensation for what they had lost and what they will lose for having stood up for truth in the first place. They want their health back. And they don't want the anxiety going forward of not being able to cope, not being able to look after the job, the family, the expenses. And they want minimum stress on their family. This is a big secondary detriment of whistleblowing that is not often spoken about. But it's equally traumatic for the family and the partner as it is for the whistleblower themselves. So what do we do about it? Well, this man, who's well known to you all, said that the world is a dangerous place, not because of people who do evil, but because of the others who don't do anything about it. So going forward, how do we make things better for those who follow in future? If we want to change the law, if we want to provide better protection for whistleblowers, compensation for detriment, oh, well, a thank you would be nice as well. Actually, what we need to do is change two things. We need to change the culture, and we actually need to change the law. To change the law, you have to influence the government. To influence the government, you have to influence the policymakers. And how, where do the policymakers get their, their information? They get them from experts. So how do you become an expert? There are two ways to become an expert, and this isn't just about whistleblowing. You either have the lived experience, or you study it. If you study it, and you have the lived experience, you can actually feed that back into the policymakers and back into the government. In my case, because you can't get another job, you have to find another route to provide those answers back into the government and hopefully find another way of earning money back into the family. So you do a master's. And I came here to do a master's in applied human rights and that led straight on into a PhD. And I'm delighted to say that I graduated in July this year with a PhD in politics. This one looked at the effects of detriment on whistleblowers and how we can help further human rights defenders. This one, the PhD, looked at why people do not blow the whistle. And I looked at my case where I did blow the whistle. And I asked all those people around me and those above them and those above them right the way up to the Prime Minister's advisers. 
why nobody blew the whistle. So I was concentrating on civil servants, military officers, and commercial employees in the defense sector. And this is what they told me. And I've taken Tom, Dick, and Harry, and the quotes they gave me. When I inquired what it was, I was told it was the overhead for getting things done, for greasing the wheels, easing the path, and keeping the services open. Dick said, I never had any proof, but you always know when something's not quite right about this through to those who picked a very careful line of sort of understanding how to deal with it, but not compromising their standards. And Harry. Harry said, what became clear to me was that really from the Middle East onwards, virtually nothing happened unless there was some form of facilitation, some support, some form of bribery. Not necessarily by our employees, but by subcontractors, by government and other MOD people who are in a leading role at facilitating the development of businesses in those particular regions. Yes, I found sufficient people to actually give me data saturation to prove that people did know about it, but didn't speak about it. So why didn't they speak about it? I'm not going to dwell on this slide. This is just to show you the kind of methodology. This is called a fishbone diagram by a Japanese gentleman called Kaoru Ishikawa who's the father of total quality management in manufacturing. But it's a useful framework to hang data on to allow you to analyze down at first level and then second level to determine why things don't happen. And it's strategic, it's organizational, it's individual influences and the reasons that they come up with. And what you hear is not always the truth. There's a truth beneath the truth. And that's what this allows you to get to. And what I determined were the, I think, the five root causes of individual silence. The first one is fear. Fear of loss of your job, your wealth, your health, and your home life, your domestic peace. That is the prime reason why people do not speak up. The second reason is futility. People think, I'm too small, you're too big. It's a minefield. I will just tread in the minefield and I'll get blown up for no reason. And therefore, why should I? The third reason is either that they're complicit or they're made to think that they are complicit. They're given a little bit and then a bigger bit and then a bigger bit. And then before it's too late, you believe that you're complicit to the whole thing and therefore you're going to be prosecuted as well. It's, it's called the boiling frog syndrome. You drop the boiling frog in cold water and warm it gently till it's too late. The fourth reason is, I call it in the grey zone. You're not brave enough to blow the whistle, but you're so uncomfortable with not blowing the whistle and being part of it that you find another way. You pour sand in the petrol tank sugar in the petrol or you in civil service terms it's a classical leak you float the information out there to people who will do something with it but you remain in the background i i, I liken it to the french resistance you don't stand up front and fight fight in a uniform because you're going to get killed you know you are but you you adopt a form of guerrilla government i draw a line in here because these are all people who could have blown the whistle and didn't. This is a bunch of people, the consequentialist utilitarians, who take the view that you don't speak up, you know it about the corruption, you're party to it, but you don't speak up about it because you have the strategic, the political, the economic view that this is for the greater good, for the greater number. This is what um, is known as the noble lie, or de Sartre calls, uh, the dirty hands syndrome. I'm prepared to get my hands dirty because I have to for the betterment of the mass. But if we put these together and we show you that here are the reasons, they create individual silence. And if you accumulate that, it becomes organizational silence. And if you accumulate that, it becomes a culture of silence. And the unfortunate thing then is that what happens is that when you have a culture of silence, 
We take new people into the system. We bring them into the company. We induct them, and then we onboard them. We train them that this is what we do and how we do it. And that creates a feedback loop. So that people become socially and culturally pre-programmed to actually become part of the system, accept the business or organizational culture, and enact it going forward and then onboard others in the future. And that creates a complete climate of silence. It's never-ending. It's a vicious circle. I want to show you something else. There's a man called Michel Foucault, who died in the late 90s, who was a French philosopher, who gave a series of lectures at Stanford on parhesia. Fearless speech, he called it. Parhesia is an ancient Greek principle where the powerful guarantee protection to the vulnerable in exchange for the truth. And it's not a new idea. It features in the Bacchae, and Euripides wrote about it in 405 BC. Whistleblowing has been going on for at least two and a half thousand years in documented evidence. I started a charity two years ago called Parhesia. Parhesia is there to try and gather in the evidence of academics and others to form a body of knowledge that we can then take to policymakers and politicians in order to enact a change in culture and a change in the law and a change in the way that we all do business to better protect those who want to stand up and speak the truth. What we do, we have a board of trustees made up of good and worthy souls. We have an executive. We formed an academic council of all the academic experts that we could find in employment law and whistleblowing law. We form a policy advisory body who tell us what is going wrong and what we should or might do about it. And we take it to the policymakers and government and the community of practice. And we're actually very lucky. We're one of the chosen bodies. Having now been arguing this with the business department for two years, we're now one of the chosen bodies to be consulted in the government's uh, framework, a uh, review of the whistleblowing framework, which is due to publish later this year. What we're trying to do is set up the idea of a parhesiastic contract. Take this idea of the protection of the vulnerable by the powerful the protection of the employee by the board members, by senior management, not as an individual contract, but as a social contract which underpins your employment. It's at multi-level. It runs throughout the organization. It's part of compliance. It's monitored. It's rewarded. It's implemented. It's actually a cross-sector application. It's not just about commercial business. It's about the NHS. It's about government. It's about local councils. It's about churches, you know, overseeing and main maintaining the, the security of those who work uh, or volunteer within their organisations. And we're taking it forward. The government has now put through an economic crime bill raising sanctions against Russian um, oligarchs. And there's a current bill, a second part to it, the Economic Crime and Transparency Bill going through, into which we have tried to insert a failure to prevent fraud and corruption clause. Because if you attack whistleblowers and take reprisals against them, you are failing to prevent fraud and corruption going forward because you're deterring others from standing up and declaring wrongdoing. In the immediate future, we're going to hopefully work with the Department of Business and Trade to try and ensure that the guidance on whistleblowing protection forms part of the uh, guidance of failure to prevent under the Economic Crime and Transparency Bill. We have the retrial of the GBT individuals this coming month. We're looking at who's who. Who are the principal people who ought to be accountable in the deniable fiddle of the Sancom case? Who's really there? Not just the managing director, but who also sanctioned it within the government systems, going back to the beginning of the project in 1978? This trial and the whole process currently has a court reporting restriction order over it. That should be lifted by the end of this year. And what then will unfold, which I can't tell you about, um, will actually take you to the next stage of where we're going in this process, which is 
trying to protect whistleblowers. Not just to give them what they want, but to give them what they need. And what they need is, they need an interim relief fund so that they don't have to bear the burden of losing their job and the costs and financial ruin. They need therapeutic counselling for the stresses and strain they go through. They need a legal support fund to balance the might of the organisation and the expensive lawyers they can afford against the individual. And we need more research into whistleblowing so that we can look at all the other aspects that are going wrong and how we can protect people better in future. And finally, I need to write the book and make the film. And it will be called An Undeniable Fiddle. Thank you very much indeed.